Recently, a W5 expose on Grenville Christian College was broadcast on CTV, a major Canadian network. Grenville Christian College, a late grade elite boarding school located near Brockville, Ontario, was referred to mockingly by some students as Grenville Concentration Camp. It's an interesting charge, but it begs the question, did Grenville Christian College use brainwashing techniques systematically for decades? This question can be answered by seeking correlations and Grenville Christian College's tactics and standard features of brainwashing as shown in the Bilderman Chart of Coercion. The Bilderman Chart of Coercion for brainwashing was developed to understand how prisoners of war were brainwashed by the enemy. It shows the following features of brainwashing. Isolation, control or distortion of perception, humiliation, threats, demonstrating superiority or power, enforcing trivial demands, exhaustion or confusion, occasional indulgences. Isolation is a powerful brainwashing tool since it deprives the victim of all social support and makes the victim dependent upon the abuser. There is ample evidence that Grenville used isolation. One former student complained about being locked in staff apartments for weeks. According to Joan Childs, a former member of staff, light sessions were isolating and damaging. More detail on light sessions will follow. Miss Bunnington, a former student, was dragged from bed by three women in the middle of the night. She was taken to a room where she was berated for hours and then she was told she was being put on discipline. She would not be allowed to talk to other students. She could not attend classes or wear the school uniform. She had to spend her days scrubbing pots, floors and toilets. She had to ask God to change her heart and she wrote letters to the headmaster about her change of heart. Joan Childs confirms that children were put on discipline for up to three weeks. Control and distortion of perception is another powerful brainwashing tool. It eliminates information that's not in agreement with the abuser's message. It punishes actions or responses that demonstrate independence or resistance. This so-called discipline not only isolated Miss Bunnington, but also controlled her perceptions. She was in effect told who she could get information from, what to think, and how to pray. Then she had to repeatedly provide evidence through her letters that she understood her abuser's message. Controlling perceptions by defining certain thoughts, behavior, and children as positive and negative was a powerful tool used by the school to isolate the rebellious and control thinking. Another interesting piece of evidence is this photo of a group of Grenville boys during their work in their section. It would be very difficult to express a different point of view in this well-controlled environment, but it would be very easy to monitor and control thoughts and behaviors. Humiliation and degradation is another mind control technique. It was certainly used at Grenville. It weakens the mind and the physical ability to resist. It heightens feelings of incompetence and induces mental and physical exhaustion. Light sessions were used to humiliate the children. Andrew Hale Byrne said that a light session was a public humiliation in front of the entire student body. A child would be stood up and he could be called egotistical, self-righteous, trash, garbage. Girls could be called Jezebel, whores, or bitches in heat. They were all told that in order to pass through the light and come to Christ, they must first hate themselves. Grenville certainly tried to help them do that. One evening when one student by the name of Michelson was talking in his sleep, he was awoken suddenly with a punch to the groin. He was grabbed by the neck, pulled into the boy's uh, washroom, 
given a toothbrush and told to clean tiles. After cleaning tiles for hours, he was urinated on by a staff member. This boy also had a problem with bed wetting. So he was brought in front of the entire student body with a rattle and a pacifier attached to his neck. His mattress, which had a yellow stain on it, was put on display. Everyone was told he was a bedwetter. Everyone was told that only babies wet the bed. Another humiliation was exorcism. One boy was exercised of the sin of dyslexia. Apparently, the teachers believed that children had learning disabilities because of demon possession. A terrible form of humiliation was for Sheila Kuntz. She was compared to Lucifer. She was told that women were whores. Then Father Farnsworth grabbed her breast and sexually abused her. Sexual abuse was confirmed by Joan Childs. Another brainwashing technique was threats. Threats create anxiety and despair. They outline the abuser's expectations and consequences for non-compliance. Father Farnsworth grabbed the boy by the neck and showed him the fires of the wood chip boiler. He pointed to the fire and s said, if you look carefully, you can see yourself in the flames. He threatened that the boy was going to go to hell if he didn't comply. Finally, the threat of future humiliation and light sessions or the isolation of discipline would have been very serious threats to hold over a young student's head. Demonstrating omnipotence or superiority or power is another brainwashing technique. It demonstrates to the victim that resistance is futile. Mark Vincent was beaten with a desktop at Grenville Christian College. He decided to write a letter home to his parents about it. Father Farnsworth checked his mail. When he discovered that uh, Vincent was about to tell the truth to his parents, he had the boy brought to his office. He screamed at the boy not to spread lies about the school. Then Vincent was forced to write a sterile letter praising the school. Enforcing trivial demands, often trivial, contradictory, non-achievable, reinforce who has power. Th this was clearly done at Grenville Christian College. Being punished for involuntary actions is a good example of this mind control technique. Being punished for involuntary responses such as talking in your sleep or bedwetting are examples of enforcing trivial demands which are not achievable, especially through abuse. Another brainwashing technique is exhaustion and confusion. The abusers at Grenville Christian College used sleep deprivation to keep victims in a state of confusion. They would wake up children in the middle of the night, pull them out into the hallway, and have miniature light sessions with them. Occasional indulgences is another form of mind control. It provides positive motivation for conforming to the abuser's demands. Victims can earn indulgences in an effort to restore their self-esteem. While the CTV report and newspaper reports have focused on negatives, it's possible that this final approach may have sown the long-term divisions at Grenville Christian College, especially in the alumni community. A possible example of an indulgence would be allowing a student to go on a school trip or to be in a school play. Or another possible example would be to convince children that a light session was going to happen, but then suddenly a more pleasant event occurred. Grenville Christian College was referred to mockingly by students as Grenville Christian Concentration Camp. They may have hit the nail on the head. Grenville Christian College may have been more similar to the Hanoi Hilton than a proper Christian school. But the prisoners at 
Grenville concentration camp were not military personnel. They were children. Their very development as human beings was grossly undermined at Grenville Christian College. To develop a deeper understanding of how this happened, we must move beyond Bilderman to Erickson. Erickson created a model for human development. Using Erickson's model, it does not take much time to see how the children's development was undermined while in the care of Grenville Christian College. The first stage of human development is developing trust. Grenville Christian College betrayed student trust. One former student, who was female and who had been sexually abused, described her inability to breastfeed her own baby. Through tactics such as light sessions, all the children had their trust undermined. The virtue associated with the development of trust is the creation of hope. Destroying trust undermines hope. The next stage in Erickson's model is autonomy versus shame. To control students, shame was clearly used on them to undermine their will and break their will. The third stage in Erickson's model is initiative versus guilt. By employing guilt, the child's sense of purpose is dissipated. In addition, by fostering feelings of inferiority, Grenville undermined the children's confidence and sense of competency. One former student described how he did not accept promotions because of feelings of inferiority or not deserving the promotion. But these feelings can act, uh, have an impact on every aspect of a person's life. While the children were in Grenville, they were supposed to be developing a sense of who they were, not a sense of who Grenville wanted them to be. But Grenville's approach was to pressure them into an identity. In some cases, this could have resulted in a negative identity. Undermining this stage of development of a child's ability to communicate and commit to others can result in isolation. In a nutshell, this is what Grenville Christian College did to their children. They undermined trust. They destroyed hope. They engineered shame. They broke wills. They dissipated purpose. They fostered feelings of inferiority. They created a negative identity. They undermined the ability to commit to an adult relationship, resulting in some uh, of their graduates living in a life of isolation. It seems an understatement to call Grenville's tactics damaging. The brave ones who have stepped forward understand what Grenville Christian College's tactics were and how very wrong their brain tact uh, washing tactics were. They are on the first step to recovery. They are making things right. The pain is clearly still there but they're moving beyond its control.